I've never, as she said in her inscription on my book, I've never trusted a woman, a woman in crinoline. But <laughs> the, 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 the book I just thought was excellent. And it gave, uh, you know, as somewhat of a student of the Civil War, it just gave insight into all the other things that were going on as opposed to the battles that you read about or the battlefield sites that you visit and that kind of thing. And to me, it was just fascinating what these uh, women did, were able to do, got away with doing for the most part. Uh, it was just, and it was really uh, well-written, well-structured. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Wonderful, that's great. Um, Lisa, else in, the, um, in the, I'm sorry, oh, Lisa in the chat, the chat she, said agreed. She's a, she agrees. Yeah, she with agrees with you, yes. 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 It's, yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? Sylvia? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book too. I thought it was amazingly fast paced because it was a fairly long, well, reasonably long book and everything. So I wasn't sure how much, how long it would take me to read it. But when I started, it was like just a few days because it was just like kept picking it back up and couldn't put it down. And uh, so I really love that she made it so fast paced. And also the way she interweaved, I mean, like um, I mean, Robert was saying and all the structure and uh, interweaving the four stories. And mm -hmm. I find sometimes with books like that, I get the characters mixed up. And uh, I didn't have that issue at all with these. I mean, she was doing such a good job of really defining each character. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, her writing style was great. Yeah, I found it a real page turner too. Um, when I first started it, I wasn't sure. And yet, like you, I finished it in a couple of days because I couldn't put it down. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very easy to read. I got into it. I would sit down to read. Oh, I'm just going to read a chapter and I would read like three or four. It just, it was so good. <laughs> Any other thoughts? John. John uh, yeah, I, I, I also found it pretty engaging and certainly a, an interesting like idea of, of how to write a book. I mean, certainly, well, you know, reasonably well researched. I mean, there's a robust note section at the end um but i i i think it's you know e even if i didn't like the book uh i think it would it's a worthwhile project to kind of take a stab at writing you know primary source researched history you know in kind of a, a novel style um it it reminds me in that way of manhunt i don't know if anyone else here has read manhunt it yes. kind of was similar in that respect um, you know, I, there are pros and cons to to that uh, that style, but I mean, I think it's a, a cool way to approach it. And, and in some ways, I, I almost wish more uh, authors, you know, like classically trained historians would would try it. I mean, it it certainly would push the comfort zone of a number of uh, academic types that I've spoken to. But it's, I think it's an interesting project, and it was, you know, certainly more engaging because of it as you know other people commented on so i i appreciated the that aspect of it very much mm -hmm. yeah i agree i think that um it, it might just spur people to do further investigation into the lives of these women and, and maybe take up a more scholarly uh book about them later on but it it, it sparks interest which i think is is super important uh, Steve, you have your hand up, Steve Gates. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. And sorry, I came on a couple minutes late here. I didn't That's make okay. the connection connection between uh, Eastern time and Central time here, so I was running a few minutes late. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, a fascinating idea. I became one of my observations was as I was reading it, I became uh, uh, more and more interested in how. The writer was juggling these uh, four different uh, stories, but also the different sources that she relied on, uh, which she disclosed in the introduction that when I use direct quotations, it's coming directly from a source. But then you look at some of the sources and their uh, memoirs that are post-war memoirs or subject to a certain amount of embellishment or historical accuracy. So I was constantly thinking about uh, 
where does the fiction begin? Where does the history begin? And how does a, a writer sort of navigate all of that? Uh, so I found that really interesting and uh, referred to the notes quite a bit. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I'm glad she included all of those notes too, for that very reason. But she had a lot of notes. I did notice that. Mm -hmm. Did anybody have a particular uh, woman's story that they thought was more interesting than the others or that they connected with more or somebody you hadn't heard of before? I, I enjoyed um, comparing and contrasting each of the women. At first, I wondered why she selected these women, but they seemed to really flow to what together very, very well and develop not only the stories, but gave us a lot of information about the actual history. A lot of it I knew, some of it was new to me. I started out thinking Emma was going to be my favorite because I was in the army, Army my but as a nurse. Oh, good for you. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I, uh, I lost kind of interest in her after a little while. Um, and I think Belle was probably ended up being the most interesting. Right. Because she really um, just was almost uncontrollable in the way she approached life. Yeah, she was no holds barred, pretty much. <laughs> right. She and Rose, really. Uh -huh. Very, very deliberate women, but not totally in control of their lives, even though they thought they were. Right. So it was very interesting. Uh -huh. Robert? Yeah, I oh, I'm sorry. I, no, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't know if Robert had his hand up. I, 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 I liked Rose. Uh, not just because of who she was and who she uh, was able to deal with on the level she was dealing, but the personal trauma that she was subjected to in the course of, you know, her being in prison and with her daughter and all of that, uh, just phenomenally remarkable woman. And I was, I was really taken with, with Rose Greenow. It's a good choice. I have to say I'm a I'm a Emma Edmonds person just because I have an interest in women soldiers. <laughs> I don't know, Rachel, did you have a favorite? I'm sorry, I muted. Uh, I I liked Sarah a lot and I liked Belle Boyd because I live actually in Martinsburg. So a lot of the areas they talked about, I knew exactly where that was. So it was just really interesting in that way to know, oh yeah, okay, I've been by her house. I know where she's talking about. And, but um, yeah, I really liked Sarah a lot. I thought she had a lot of guts and she was pretty, pretty awesome. I liked her. Nice. Sylvia? Yeah, I really, I mean, Belle Boy kind of scared me actually a little bit. I'd heard of her before and knew a little bit, but learning more about her, I'm not sure we would have been friends and all. I would have been a little nervous around her. Um, but I ended up, I really liked Elizabeth Van Lu. She was the one I pictured me being like, this is the one I would be friends with. She's kind of quiet behind the scenes and all, and, you know, hiding people, doing quiet. I, just, I really liked her approach to it. It was a lot more behind the scenes. Some of the others seemed to want more attention and uh, more kind of credit for what they were doing. And uh, where she was willing to take a step back there and be unpopular with her neighbors. And I thought that was really admirable. Like, I mean, she was willing to put herself through social isolation and uh, be standing up to all these people who really kind of in many ways made her life miserable <laughs> for the rest of her life in many ways. So I really well, it, it looks like uh, Lisa L agrees with you. She says, I think Elizabeth Van Lu was my favorite. I think I felt impressed by her commitment to stay in what became basically enemy territory. Yeah, indeed, she was surrounded. Qu quickly on that point um, about like the 
threatening messages and stuff she received. Can we talk about how creepy that note was? Like on, I guess, page 332, the tail end of 1863, that like sort of horrific note she got. <laughs> that, like, I was like legitimately creeped out when, I, not just when I read it, but then they have the picture of it on the following page. It was like, ooh. Oh, the one, yeah, and they have like the skull and crossbones drawn on it. And yeah, that that's a creepy stalker note. <laughs> Worley, you have your hand up, Worley Smith. I just <clears throat> wanted to talk about Sarah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm from Michigan. I live in Holly. And uh, Sarah, prior to joining the uh, Second Michigan Infantry, was working in Rose Township, which is about five miles from me. She was working on a farm there. She went to Flint, joined the 2nd uh, Infantry, and when they took, left Flint on a train, they stopped in Holly, and the ladies in Holly fed them all lunch. So I know that Sarah was in Holly. Uh, my thing, there are some issues. I have some issues with, I, I know she was a soldier. I know she enlisted, but some of the exploits Behind the lines, I think, might have been embellished. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I really like about her is the book that she wrote and she sold, and all the money went to the soldiers. Now, that yes. I really like. Yeah, nurse and spy in the Union Army. Yeah, and and all the proceeds went to this the uh, the to help the the veterans and wounded soldiers soldiers and and, and that was so commendable of her to do that. Indeed. Oh, and it looks like we got a couple of notes here in the chat. Uh, Libby Mac McNamee um, says she's working on a book on Elizabeth Van Lu. That's very cool. Oh, cool. Once it's published, please send it to the museum for our review and we'll might put it in our bookstore. Yep. <laughs> Looks like we've got uh, some other some ref other references too for Elizabeth Van Lu in the chat. Um, some some more uh, another book to to check out. And Steve, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, I was going to follow up a little bit on uh, what Orly was talking about with uh, with with Sarah, but it's also a theme throughout the entire book. You know, there are a lot of interesting insights on gender. Uh, sexuality, gender identity, and those types of things, uh, as it was perceived, talked about, thought about in the uh, during the Civil War. And I found particularly interesting uh, when one of uh, Sarah's admirers, through friendship, uh, the soldier named Jerome, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, he's really smitten with Frank, uh, the friendship, and talks about that. And then it becomes more apparent that there's something mysterious about Frank. And he, uh, I found it interesting that even in his journal, he was afraid to be direct and candid about the subject. And he would talk around it and make innuendos, even in his own journal. And I think that's sort of a, uh, a testament to how reserved people were about talking about gender and identity and sexuality. Uh, yeah, I just found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't know, quite know what to what to do with Frank uh, once he found out. <laughs> uh, and to riff on that point just a little bit too, um, it's interesting how uh, all four of these women sort of were both, uh, you know, aware of and taking advantage of sort of how people thought about women at the time, what they would or wouldn't be expected to do um, and, and whatnot, and how they kind of intentionally tried to work around that or use that to their advantage. Um, yeah, just the the way that they all approached it in their their own ways. I mean, several of them for kind of similar ends to help their respective side in the conflict. But yeah, I, I love that point, Steve, about how the, we, we get a window. That's not necessarily the point of the book, but like you get a window into how they thought about, you know, how women were thought about at the time. Mm -hmm. 
I think that 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 point about where things were at that time makes what these women did all the more remarkable mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't in any kind of a woke environment or anything else. They were doing this when, you know, women were chattel, if you will. And I, I, I say that not derogatorily, but they were in effect uh, in the system as it existed, uh, totally subordinate. And these, these women just, God bless them. They were just, they were gonna do what they thought should be done and they uh, did it at tremendous risk to themselves and, and those around them. Mm -hmm. So I, I just applaud them. I mean, talk about being ahead of your time. Absolutely, agreed. Diane, you have your hand out? Yeah, I do. Um, who is Sarah? I read the book and I'm confused. I don't know who Sarah is. Oh, uh, we're talking about uh, Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sometimes oh, she's yeah. called oh. Emma Edmonds, sometimes oh, Sarah Emma I, Edmonds. That's how I know her, or Frank, Emma or, or Frank. Frank. Yeah, Franklin oh, Thomas. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. That's okay, appreciate it. And Worley? Coming back on the, and the, the ladies uh, joining the service in that, I believe that the, you know, the general rule of thumb was if it wore a dress, it was a woman. If it wore pants, it was a man. And it was against the law, illegal for a woman to enlist in the army. And yet so many of these, if you read other stories and, and episodes, if you would, um, these ladies would get caught, sent home, re-enlist in another unit and just, just keep going. So there was, you know, whether it was a patriotic or they thought it was their duty, but I agree, they were totally out of their their norm or they should have been at home watching the kids or you know doing something like that. But I was just always amazed when um, you will find these ladies that were caught, sent home, re-enlisted and went back in. Yeah, it's amazing, and and it's it's uh it's great that there's an interest on this topic because our next book assignment for the book club is going to be a, a book entirely about women soldiers. So uh, we're kind of setting up for that, which is great. Oh, John's got it. John's Thank you, got John. it. Okay. Yeah, I've got it too. <laughs> um, Karen mentioned in the chat that. Uh, probably been caught a lot sooner today. No one expected a woman to dress like a man and go off to war. Exactly. They yep. didn't. That was no. completely out of the norm. Yeah, they, they didn't think women uh, were capable of handling uh, the, the physical tasks of being a soldier. They didn't think women even would want to be a soldier. Um, it wasn't in their in their mindset, so to speak. Sylvia? Yeah, I thought it was also interesting as with the, like their mindsets and stuff. I mean, they were all like challenging the norms and all for women at their time. And all, but it's like they weren't doing it like for themselves or to find their own identity. Like each one of them was doing it for like a larger cause and everything. And all, whether the cause was good or not, it's different. But I mean, but they were each like thinking outside of themselves. And uh, not just you know, I feel like today, like sometimes people just stop. Well, I want to fight for my own rights. I want to fight for the, you know, which is okay. I mean, that's good. But they were really like was with it was fine for somebody else's rights and all that. I mean, they were all looking toward larger causes and trying to use it like that way. And so I thought that was really admirable too. Exactly, and I think they 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 probably would wonder why we were calling them, you know, early feminists, because I'm sure that wasn't in their mind when they were doing all of this. They were doing it for a cause that they believed in, um, be it the Union cause or the Confederate cause. They weren't really doing it to advance the place of women in society or anything. It's just um, just happens that they did that in addition to fighting for the cause they believed uh, in. But first, I want to say to, to folks, uh, welcome. please welcome our, our author, Abbott, is it Kaler? Is that how you pronounce your last name? It is name? Kaler, yeah. Kaler, okay, yeah. Abbott Kaler. She's the author, uh, writing as Karen Abbott, of four New York Times bestselling works of narrative nonfiction, Sin in the Second City, American Rose, of course, the one we just read, Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy, and most recently, The Ghosts of Eden Park. 
which is an Edgar Award finalist for Best Fact Crime. Uh, she has been uh, a uh, Wall Street Journal names her one of the masters of the art of narrative nonfiction, as I think a lot of us have agreed after reading this book. Uh, her Very podcast about, about the bootlegger George Remus is forthcoming from iHeartMedia in May. Uh, Where You End, her debut novel written as Abbott Kaler is forthcoming in January 2024. And her next nonfiction book, Then Came the Devil, is forthcoming later in 2024. So you are a busy person. Yeah, yeah, more so than usual lately. So I'm <laughs> I'm really glad that we could have, have tonight and, and chat about uh, Lady Spies and the Civil War. Um, I very uh, thank you, Tracy, for that introduction. And um, I just want to say I remember speaking at the at the museum um, back when Liar Temp Temperature Soldier Spy came out, and um, it was such a fun event. And I sort of uh, I always wanted to do something again with you. So this is this is really nice. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. We're glad to yeah. have you. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I have, I just, uh, someone's participating with us tonight. This oh. is my parrot. <laughs> this is Dexter. So if you hear any weird squawking noises, it's not me. Um, it's not a child. It is my bird. Uh, he's being very demanding right now. So, um, and anyway, I, I usually start off, um, uh, you know, I, just to give you an idea of how I got into the subject matter, I'm from Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, but in uh, 2000, 2000, I think it was, I moved down to Atlanta, Georgia, where I lived for several years, six or seven years. Um, and it was quite a culture shock, uh, as you can imagine, moving from, from Philadelphia to the deep south. And, uh, you know, you you just sort of get used to the Southernisms that that are all around you there and jokes about the war of Northern aggression and and that kind of thing. Um, and I never really thought much of the Civil War until I moved down there. And uh, but it, but it just sort of steeped in the daily life and conversation in a way it never does up north. And uh, one day I remember that I was driving on Route 400. If anybody has ever been stuck in traffic on Atlanta's Route 400, you know what a harrowing experience that can be. Um, and I was stuck behind a pickup truck with a bumper sticker that said, don't blame me. I voted for Jeff Davis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was looking at this bumper sticker for quite some time that afternoon and um, really started thinking about the Civil War. And my mind always goes to, well, in any historical, you know, in any subject of history that I start to think about, my mind always goes to, well, what were the women doing? I always wanted to know what the women were doing. Um, and I, you know, some women were... Um, uh, holding fundraisers and raising funds for the troops. Some were sewing uh, uniforms. Um, women were, of course, uh, volunteering as nurses. And then there were some women who, of course, dared to go further than that, and they became spies for the Union and for the Confederacy. They sort of put everything on the line um, for their perceived uh, idea of how the country should look and what, what the country should be and their own perceived sense of safety and, um, and decided to, you know, sort of lay it all on the line and, and become spies. And um, I found four women who um, I thought were really interesting representatives of both the North and the South. Um, and my goal with this book was to really, you know, the, the role of a historian or narrative, uh, people write narrative history is just to really tell the story of what happened, uh, warts and all, just tell the story. Um, you're not supposed to inject your own politics into it or anything like that. You just tell the story. Um, and you really try, my goal, I always like to say that people who write narrative history in the business of time travel, you know, my goal is to sort of immerse immerse the reader into an experience where they almost might be disoriented when they close the book or put it down for the day, or they might just be like, "Whoa, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the, you know, late in the 21st century. I, I still feel like I'm, I'm still in 1864, you know, watching the the soldiers pass by my house, that kind of thing. So, so that really, that was the goal. And I, I looked for two women, uh, four women who had different uh, backgrounds, were coming from different places, had different motivations, uh, different ways of going about spying, to really get at a representative idea of, of what it was like to be a woman during this time and feeling like, you well, you weren't allowed to enlist. Um, what what could you do to serve your your side? Um, and so that's how I, of course, you know, one of them did disguise herself and enlisted, but that's a whole other, uh, you know, we could get into that. 
but I'd really love to just, um, you know, open it up to questions and discussions. Um, anything you guys want to talk about is, is fair game for me. Um, but, but I had a lot of fun writing about this book and, and researching these women and, um, and, you know, really glad. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, give me the chance to, to talk about them again tonight. And, and I, I really hope you enjoy the, the story. And we all agree it was a real page turner. Everybody, okay. everybody finished it a lot sooner than they expected. <laughs> oh, good. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. I absolutely loved your book. Um, Abbott, this is Rachel. I'm sorry. I can't get my Hi, camera to work. No, no, that's but, great. Um, I absolutely, I just have to say, I absolutely loved it. It was such a page turner. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, uh, Sylvia's got her hand up. Yeah, Sylvia. I really love the book too. And uh, I was wondering though, were there any women that you wanted to write about, but weren't able to include in the book and you didn't find enough information really or you question. just needed to cut some pages or something or? <laughs> no, it's a really good question. And and thank you for the previous compliment too. I, I think I cut out there for a second. Um, uh, thank you. And um, it's a very good question. I actually considered um, a fifth spy. Um, I don't know if anybody there has heard the story of Pauline Cushman. Yes. But, um, yeah. But she 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 enters the war just about the same time that Emma uh, Emma Edmonds leaves it, and in, around the same place. So I thought, well, that's kind of fortunate. If it would be sort of a seamless way uh, to to put get Pauline Cushman's story in there, and and you're still writing about four spies. And I I would have done that if Pauline Cushman had had a career, a spy career that really affected the Union's uh, victory, really contributed to the Union's cause. Um, and then something that sort of stretched all the way to the end of the book, but as dramatic and wonderful as her story is, um, it, it just didn't, it didn't justify me including it because it was short, it was a short story and, um, it, it really, you know, it, it just didn't make sense to me in the larger scheme of the narrative. But if anybody wants to do further reading, uh, Paul and Pauline Cushman's life is really quite fascinating. Uh, Steve, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, Thank you. Steve. Really enjoyed it. Very unique. And I'm looking at it. I mentioned this uh, observation a little bit during the earlier discussion. I'd be just interested on your thoughts as a writer and a researcher perspective. You, you have four different uh, characters here, people, but you have varying uh, types of sources for each one that you have to rely on. And so I'm wondering how you navigated those uh, primary accounts, you know, when you know that uh, I believe uh, Elizabeth is the only one that didn't have a, didn't self-publish something about her experience. Yeah. Uh, and you have two of them that critics say were maybe somewhat embellished and where's the history, where's the fiction? And so yeah. I'm just curious, you know, how did you uh, tackle that as a writer researcher so that uh, you had a good story to tell, but you're also trying to, here's the history, here's the fiction. Right. No, it's a really great question, especially in the tradition of civil war, which is all about self-mythology. You know, these these people came out of the war and just started telling stories about their adventures in the war. Um, you know, men and women alike did this. Uh, so any wherever it was possible, I tried to verify the women's own stories with the historical record. Um, you know, going back into the into the archives and things like that, the the regiment information and and all of that. Um, I also, in the narrative, uh, you know, would put indicate where it might be a self embellishment, so that somebody could know to take it with a grain of salt um, as they were reading it. And um, and you know, I I I often think that. But I, but I wouldn't exclude it on that basis. I would just sort of put an asterisk there and say, just watch out for this, and and you know, just know that this might be something a fabrication or something that's embellished. I I, I don't exclude that stuff because I think that what people choose to lie about and what they choose to omit is every bit as interesting and as important to their story as what they choose to say. Um, you know, the the lies and the omissions are are also part of the story. So wherever I could, I I really just try to verify it with outside sources. Fortunately, Belle Boyd in particular was very eager to give interviews. There were a lot of contemporary newspaper uh, reports of people who had interviewed her and that sort of thing. A lot of Belle Boyd um, showed up in other memoirs uh, who, that corroborated what she had said about her own her own story. Um, so so things like that. And with Elizabeth, 
um, who was really the true spy, uh, the, the, I guess the best spy among the bunch. Um, she, all of her papers were in the New York public library and she actually had buried a lot of them. Um, as I think I mentioned at the end of the book and, and they were uncovered and no, she didn't, she didn't publish a memoir, but she kept a diary. And I think a lot of it was lost. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I think that, um, her story in particular was truthful and um, easily to be verified through record. So, and when you have, you know, J Ulysses S. Grant saying, you know, you were the, the biggest help to me throughout the war at the end of the war, um, I think that really says something again to, to her personal, uh, cooperates her own personal story too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I've, I've, oh, I'm I've sorry. read, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I've read uh, Emma Edmonds' uh, memoirs, The Nurse and Spy in the Union Army, um, and it it there's a lot in there that that she might have um, sort of made changed around a little bit to make it more acceptable to a 19th century audience, um, because I noticed she doesn't really dwell on the fact that she's doing a lot of this stuff dressed as a man <laughs> yeah she 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 really is cagey about that and you can understand why yes. um there was actually a really excellent biography of emma edmonds that i relied on um somebody who um did do a lot of digging in the, in the archives to corroborate her own stories um at least about where she was at the time uh, you know where her regiment was and could could she have been doing this given where her regiment was at any given time um, but yeah, she, but a, lo a lot of the personal stuff, um, yeah, you know, but, but, you know, you did have her, 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 um, her fellow soldiers come up at the end and say, we had no idea that, that, that Emma was a woman and she was brave and she did do these things and she was, you know, on the front lines frequently and et cetera. So I thought that the, the testimonies at the end were also very telling in terms of what she was truthful about. Absolutely. And and she ended up being the only woman soldier to get a pension from the U.S. government, which was yeah. pretty impressive. So, yeah. yeah amazing. Um, we we have a Jane I think Elizabeth Van Loo would have gotten some, some, something. But. <laughs> we do have a question in the chat from Lisa. She says, do you have any thoughts about how much of the accounts were perhaps embellished? I'm thinking particularly of Belle because she comes across as the type that may have been a bit self-aggrandizing. Yeah, I mean, with Bell, uh, like I said, I was fortunate to. There was a lot of contemporary interviews with her, um, who, where I'm sure she also embellished. But I can't tell you how many time, just brief mentions she showed up in various soldiers' memoirs about about Bell Boyd and where she was and who she was flirting with, and like they were even more audacious than what she herself was talking about. Um, and at some point, I mean, to me, Belle was comic relief. She was basically a 17 year old girl, you know, it was like Civil War girls gone wild. Woo! <laughs> you know, war was a fun game to her. So, you know, I, you, you read about Belle and, you know, you kind of sort of, you know, she's embellishing. And, and I talk about the fact that she liked to embellish and self aggrandize And I, you know, I, I, really thought people would read her character in that spirit. Um, and like I said, anything I could verify, I did. And fortunately, a lot of people did come across Bell Boyd and she was doing the things that she said she was doing, you know, in a, in a majority of the time. Uh, James Lett has a question in the, in the chat. He says, I kept wondering which was which of the liar, temptress, soldier, spy, which was which perhaps all had a facet of each of the title's personalities. Yeah, I actually, it's a good question. And I, I meant, I meant for those four words to portray for everyone to be, um, of those words. So, so at various times they were a liar, they were a temptress, they were a soldier, they were a spy. I, I think it really applied to all of them. And so funny when, when I was thinking about titles for this book, um, I said to my, one of the titles was like liar mother in my soldier spy and my editor who was a man said the easiest way to not get men to buy books is by putting mother in the title. <laughs> so that title was Nick. <laughs> No, I like the title a lot because it it, yeah. it really is. It makes you want to open it up and see what what what's going on with the with that. Right. And of course, yeah. my apologies to John, the great John Lacroix. <laughs> Robert, do you do you have a question? Well, not really a question, just a comment. And now that uh, Karen is on with us, I just wanted to compliment you again on your book. 
I was at the presentation to the Army Navy Club in 2015. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, and I still don't trust ladies in crinoline. <laughs> oh, I love it. You still have the, like, my, uh, my, uh, my little line view. That's so funny. <laughs> I, I do indeed. It's right here. Somewhere. I love it. I love it. Uh, anyway, uh, an excellent read then and again for this presentation now. I just thank want you. to thank you. And the other observation I'd make, you know, we've had a number of questions in the last few minutes on, on truth. And uh, the older I get, and there isn't too much older to get for me, but, but uh, it's fluid. And uh, people's recollections, even one's own. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they, they, you go back to where you were as a as a kid and your your childhood home and all of that, and it isn't the way you remembered it, and it's just yeah. it's interesting. So that the, you know, the questions about the veracity or or the, the degree of truth in any of the uh, the writings, I think is uh, it's some fluid, and you've got to take it with a little bit of expansion, you know, built in. It's not going to be absolute. It never is. Is yeah. is it isn't in our day-to-day -day existence as we know so well these days. I think that's uh, a bit more point. Yeah. So anyway, but I thank you. It was delightful eight years ago and it was delightful now. Thank you so much. And and I really appreciate you reading it twice. <laughs> so that's a nice compliment. Thank you. And I and I do, you make an excellent point. I mean, um, you know, people's memories are subjective. Um, so it's it's um it's 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 something good to remember yeah steve steve has mute. his hand up yeah i'll mute myself here first i'm sorry uh, <laughs> two things one was just a comment and then the other is a question is uh with bell fairly early in the process i think one of the things i found fascinating was she was and you, you made a point to it earlier that she was you know she's young she's 17 18 and to me she was more caught up in the aura of this adventure and the opportunities here and, and all of that than she really was the substance of actually spying and and getting all the things done of uh of real value yeah. and so i found that really interesting and fascinating just as a unique part of her character and that sustained uh, throughout the uh, the entire work question I had for you is uh, you know, a book like this is an enormous undertaking so I'm just curious you know how long did it take you to put this together and what kind of if any help resources did you have to to do yeah this? it's a great question it took about five years for this book and um, which is a really long time I mean that's it's one of the things that's difficult about nonfiction where um, if you if you were going to undertake a book, you better make sure you really like the subject matter. You better make sure that you want to spend five years of your life with these people, um, day in and day out. Often, you know, writer's life is so lonely, as they say, but it's true. You know, sometimes I will go days without talking to anybody but the dead people. You know, <laughs> um, and uh, and so it did take about five years. And and a part of that is just having you know having to brush up on Civil War history. I mean, I hadn't read or studied the Civil War since high school or college and um, just sort of refreshing myself with who the generals were and and what the you know the battles and and the personalities um, and so that that took its own its own uh, great amount of time um, and as for help you know I, I don't really hire researchers per se I will um, I, I do have somebody at the National Archives who was very, very helpful in this because I don't know if anybody's there has tried to do research at the National Archives, but if you don't know what you're doing, you could spend a whole day there just filling out slips and not getting any files pulled for you. So um, all hail the really smart, savvy researchers who are, you know, work for the work at the National Archives on a daily basis. Uh, so that was really helpful. Um, but other than that, I, I do a lot of my own. Um, I, I reach out and find out where the archives are. I use WorldCat, which basically tells you what's in every library in the world. It's a pretty comprehensive resource. Um, you know, old newspaper subscriptions, going to Elizabeth Van Lewis papers at, uh, at the New York Public Library, going down to West Virginia um, to for Bell um, uh, and uh, Michigan for Emma. Uh, going Rose Greenhow, you know, down North Carolina. So like, you know, you, you, I made a bunch of pilgrimages um, 
And, and <laughs> I think my favorite one, I, I think it's important because you also want to sort of see where these people uh, would inform these people, what they're, what, what it, the, obviously the town's not going to look like it did when they live there, but you just sort of like this walk where they walked. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my favorite bit of research was going to the uh, reenactment of the um, first bull run. It was the 150th reenactment of the first bull one run. So it was kind of a big deal um, in Manassas. And, uh, and, you know, you have to really admire these reenactors. They get fully in the costume, meticulous historical detail down to the facial hair that the, <laughs> that the soldiers would have been wearing at the time. Um, but you, you know, you still get these anachronisms obviously, cause it's, we're not, it's 150 years later and they're bleachers for you to sit on. And, <laughs> and, um, you know, and my favorite part of this was there was a, a father and maybe his 10 year old son right there in front of me. And, and the dad said, son, you know, look, there's Stonewall Jackson by the power lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, but it was, it was wonderful. And I, I just had such a great time uh, researching this book and, and, you know, uh, actually could have kept on going. I really enjoyed it that much. So. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia's got a question. I was just wondering too, I mean, after five years and uh, um, we were talking some before you came on about which one was our favorite and all the four oh. of them. Um, I was wondering if you had a favorite. Oh God. You know, I, I admired them all for different reasons. I mean, I would have to say, obviously rogue, rose greenhouse politics are important. Um, I, you know, and I, I had to sort of um, gear myself up sometimes to write about her, but I, uh, but I just on a purely fun level, um, I would say, uh, God, it was fun to write about Emma Edmonds because just the sheer variety of what she had to do to um, disguise herself and pull that off, and and just how these men didn't recognize, you know, that she was a woman, um, and and how various other women who tried to do what Emma did and got caught, how they were caught, you know. You know, the, the one story about the general throwing an apple and the, the soldier mistakenly like, you know, made the motion to lift up her skirt to catch an apple and that gave her away. I mean, and the idea that, you know, they really didn't recognize uh, these, these people were women because they had no idea what a woman looked like wearing pants. It was so unfathomable <laughs> that even if a woman was standing right in front of you, you know, you just wouldn't see it because she was wearing pants. Um, so that was a lot of fun, just sort of the, all of the subterfuge that went around that. Um, but as far as pure spying went, I mean, I, Elizabeth Van Loo was just kind of a, a, the breathtaking bravery that she, um, displayed being a major, major union spy, possibly the most, arguably the most important one they had, at least toward the end of the war, um, doing this in the heart of the Confederate capital, um, with eyes on her and, and sort of, uh, but you know, how many times she risked her life and Mary and also Mary Bowser equally dangerous for Mary Bowser to be involved in that operation. Um, and perhaps even more dangerous for Mary Bowser. So, so that was just sort of, um, um, I wish, you know, there, there are rumors that Mary Bowser actually kept the diary of her time in the, in the Confederate white house, but, um, um, and then a family member not realizing what it was threw it away decades later, but, I don't know if that's true, but it's like oh sort gosh. of like a tiger in the heart. I mean, it, oh. can you imagine if that if that document existed? But um, I, I mean, there's no doubt uh, that that both of those women were instrumental to to the Union victory. Larry, your hand up. Yes, thank you. First of all, Karen, I want to say it's good to hear from you again. You did a talk about your book at the Smithsonian, and. Yes underground auditorium and yes. and i enjoyed that and you autographed i think it must have been where i bought your book because you autographed it for me and we discussed briefly then uh not only the subject of never trust a woman in a criminal but maybe you shouldn't <laughs> trust a man in a criminal and either that was me <laughs> <laughs> that's very true <laughs> yes i don't know whether you remember that episode or not i do remember uh, it now it's coming back to me yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. That was, that was yes. I remember that. <laughs> Recently, so I haven't had the chance to reread the book. I'm going to. Uh, but I thought I would make this comment. Uh, a few years ago, I was touring the uh, White House of the Confederacy in Richmond. And uh, 
and I had a question for the the tour guide about Mary Bowser. Mm-hmm. And his response was there was no record that Mary Bowser actually existed. That is not true. Ooh. That is absolutely not I, true. That's right. It's not true either. But that's what he said. That's um, really. They should fire that person and hire somebody who knows more about Mary Bowser. Well, I mean, even if you don't think she did everything that she said to have done, she was a person who existed. Um, she, there's absolutely no question that she was a person who who existed. So, well, yes. Um, yeah, that's yeah. so that's very bizarre. That um, I mean, even Elizabeth wrote about her herself. Yeah, I don't well, think she invented her out of thin air. <laughs> the, the the quest uh, to educate folks continues. Yeah, Indeed. that's really that's really sad. And I I wonder, um, you know, to, at the time, did you think about like telling anyone there or that? Or I'm just curious. I did not undertake the the task of straightening. <laughs> you didn't take the task of getting the getting the docent in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't. I I didn't do that. I just. Just made a mental note of, of it. And, yeah. and, and well, they on. are wrong. Whoever said that is wrong. <laughs> That's so funny, though. Uh, Christine. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the way you uh, structured the book, going from 1861 to 1865. Oh, thanks. The book was very, very interesting. As everybody's noted, it's really held interest. But I learned so much as well because of the way you structured it and it just flowed so that oh, good. I understand better how the different battles occurred in the different years and progressed. Um, yeah. The other thing is I live in Richmond. And so what I really enjoyed was the detail because I would pull up my maps and try to find out where these places were um, according to the current maps. And so- yeah. I can go and visit some of these places now. So I really appreciate that. Oh, oh wonderful. wonderful. I, it, Richmond is such a great city. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me, though, that the Van Loo house was torn down. I mean, I know. it's such a shame. It was probably a political statement. Well, it most was definitely a political statement more than yeah. anything else. It was. But um, but it's such a wonderful city. Uh, and amazing history, beautiful homes. Oh my God, I think you have the most beautiful architecture. I do think Mary Bowser is much more talked about nowadays. Yeah, good. I, I think the histories um, behind her presence in the White House of the Confederacy is much more standardized now. So I do good. think, I think the tour guides today would probably point her out. Yes, one can hope, and and that's true. And and I'm glad that she's finally getting her due. And then people, um, when Elizabeth Van Loo is brought up, you can't really bring up Van Loo without bringing up Mary Bowser. And I think that's that's fair and correct. So that's that's good. Uh, Lisa L says that uh, apparently she did the same thing with uh, with checking out the location. She says she's in Stafford, Virginia. Okay. Nice. I I love that people are doing the little Civil War. <laughs> Field trips. And Rachel, you mentioned you're in Martinsburg. Yes. Yes. I live in Hedgesville, which is just outside Martinsburg. So oh, very cool. And of course, Martinsburg has their own little museum, the Bell Boyd yes. House. Yeah, yeah. Which actually had a lot of great stuff. Um, in fact, that's where I found my favorite, one of my favorite pieces of documentation was the letter that Bell wrote to her cousin, where she was like, I am beautiful. <laughs> That one it's like at the beginning of the book where yeah. she just talks about how great and beautiful she is and oh yeah she and it's time for it's time for the men to fight over her to marry her yeah yeah, yeah she was something else <laughs> yeah I loved Belle I mean I I just you know she she just was fun she was a fun and she really worshiped Stonewall Jackson too oh, she like did. that was very evident yeah, she did. And I, I double checked all of that stuff. People, I mean, that running through the battlefield to deliver his, that letter to him was actually, you know, that was true and verified. And, um, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you want to say that Bell Boyd was a bad spy, but at least she was an excellent courier, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and a pretty good shot too. <laughs> and a very good shot. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. 
Well, it looks like it's eight o'clock, so we have yeah. uh, we can wind this up. And uh, anybody else have any final words or anything, Abbott? You want to say to wind no, things up here? Thank you for doing this. I'd love to. I love your group. If you ever want to do it for another book. Um, and uh, stay in touch. I love staying in touch with readers. So if you guys want to email me, I'm at abbottauthor at gmail.com. Um, easy to remember. Um, but but yeah, so I, 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 you know, thank you. It's always, <laughs> it's always fun to revisit these characters from the past and, and talk with readers who, who enjoyed the stories. Oh, it was great to have you on. We really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. And, I oh, think and if everybody... anybody wants to write a Goodreads or Amazon review, you know, that'd be good. Brief, you know, brief and five stars is all it takes. <laughs> oh, there you... we go. There we go. Yeah. And uh, we we have your book in our bookstore. So. Oh, very cool. Can, Thank you for doing that. Have, have a lot of people that, that now can recommend it to our visitors. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, next time around, uh, we're going to be, the next book we're going to be covering is uh, a book that's totally on women soldiers. It's uh, They Fought Like Demons uh, yeah. by Lauren Cook and uh, Andy Ann Blanton. So we're- that was, I would just, a plug for that book. I, it was one of my sources for- you know, Oh, excellent. I, yeah, and it's and it's really well researched and, and entertaining. So I think y'all enjoy it. Great. Great. Well, that's the next one. We give everybody a month to uh, to read it. Our next meeting is going to be, uh, when is it, Rachel? May 14th? Uh, you know what? Hang on. I can tell you in just a second when I get the <laughs> calendar up. Um, it's actually May 9th. May 9th. Okay. May, May 9th. 9th. It's okay. 7 um, Eastern time. So. Seven Eastern Time, May 9th. Okay. And uh, if, if anybody needs a copy, um, you can go to our museum website, civilwarmed.org, and go into the store and you can purchase a copy there uh, if you need one. Um, so also, we encourage. Also, if you do want to join us for the next um, uh, book club meeting, um, if you could just re register, that way um, I can just have you down and I know it's kind of a pain, but um, if you can just go back to that link and just re-register, that way I have a, a list of everybody. So. And we know who to, who do it, how many to expect uh, for yeah. the next session. Right. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us on this uh, on this adventure and our yeah. our first uh, session. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank again, you to Abbott. All. Yeah, and please stay in touch if you want to. If you have any more questions, please feel free to email me if you think of something later. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Bye, All guys. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank have you. And hopefully, I'll get to everybody else, or everybody can see me next time, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you don't look like the logo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone.